Yep, yeah, okay, I'm Dom, N1DM, as everybody's heard a couple of times, and good evening. Uh, I finally made it after the January thing where I just did it online, so nice to see you all and meet you all. Um, we're going to talk about satellites tonight. This is a picture of AO7, less its solar panels. This is the oldest active satellite. Now, it was launched in 1974. Uh, it's still active, even though it doesn't have batteries anymore, so it only works in sunlight. To give you an idea, it's the satellite's about 14 inches tall. With the solar panels installed, it's about 16 inches in diameter. Uh, it has two amateur transponders on it. And I'll explain what a transponder is in a minute, but one goes from 2 meters to 10 meters. So a station coming in on 2 goes out on 10. The other one, a station going on out, coming in on 432, comes out on two. Uh, satellite weighs 65 pounds, and uh, so it's a it's a substantial piece of equipment. The, all that wiring in there ties in the computers, the command system, uh, the radios, obviously, and a few other little odds and ends that need to make it work. Tonight, I'm going to talk mostly about the FM voice and the linear satellites that do CW and sideband. I'm only going to make a minor comment on the International Space Station. I have one slide at the end. I'll also not talk too much about the data satellites. Even I'm going to bring one up because it's kind of interesting and people might find it useful in the future. Uh, satellites aren't hard to do. Uh, well within the capa capacity of most hands. There's a lot of satellites available now, as you'll see. Tracking a satellite in Doppler ship should not scare you. Uh, it's not a, a big deal. Radios do not need to be specialized. Um, if you have an FT-847, an FT-817, an old Kenwood TS-2000, they all work on satellites and people use them every day. Um, what subbands are available? Currently, there's one satellite that takes a 15-meter uplink uh, to a 432 downlink. That's a Chinese satellite that just became available November, I think it was. Uh, AO7, which we just showed a picture of, has a downlink on 10 meters from 2 meters. Most of the satellites are on 2 and 70 centimeters. And there are two satellites in blue there that are shown on 13 centimeters and 3 centimeters, uh, 2.4 uh, gig and 10.4 gig. They're not available around here, but they are in use. By far, 2 and 70 centimeters are what everybody generally starts with. Um, what are we talking about? There are right now the seven FM satellites that are real are active and regularly available. They're easy to work. You don't need a lot of power. Four or five watts of walkie will do it. Um, you don't need a super uh, crazy antennas. Azo beams are nice, but a, a small handheld beam or some of these uh, you'll see the some Omni antennas they can use. Uh, dual band FM transceiver or two single band transceivers will work. Doesn't cost a lot. Most of us own a dual band radio nowadays on 2 and 440. And simultaneous signals. The only issue is the satellite can only pass one signal at a time. So it's a little bit of a, a fight to see who gets through, but it, it does work. The linear and SSB satellites, there's 10 of those currently. They're medium difficulty because there's a, some issues about tracking uh, the radios, VFOs. Uh, powers again about five watts, and that's reasonable. Again, same antenna situation. The only difference here is you need an SSB and CW trans uh, transceiver or two two radios that are capable. And I, we've done it both ways over the years. Uh, more than five signals are possible one time on the linear satellites uh, because that, they have at least twenty kilohertz of bandwidth. We all remember SSB two point four kilohertz roughly. Uh, so you can stuff a few signals in there. And it will pass them all simultaneously without distortion. So let's talk about what's in an FM satellite. And this is a 2 to 70 centimeter satellite. So you see on the left is a 2 meter FM receiver, single channel. All the audio coupling, keying and processing to, to say there's a signal there and key the transmitter and send the audio to it. And a 70 centimeter transmitter. And that's what a repeater is that we all use on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Only difference here is they're on different bands. There is also a telemetry system sometimes used. Not too many FM satellites have telemetry, but a, a few still do. The combiner there allows the two transmitters to be combined and sent to one antenna. Um, 
A linear satellite's a little different. You're going to hear these referred to as transponders, especially if you read any of the literature, uh, magazines, books, any of that stuff. <coughs> Again, they have a two meter wide band amplifier coming in and a filter and an RF amp. They go into a mixer and then there's a local oscillator that goes in the mixer and out comes a 70 centimeter signal to a combiner. And if you'll note, those three blocks, the two meter front end, the mixer, the local oscillator, are the parts of a the beginning of a traditional super hat radio. Nothing that different than what we see. Only difference is the filters wide band. Uh, again, there's a beacon. Almost every linear satellite has a beacon. So there's a telemetry system with a modulator and a beacon transmitter. It's combined together and goes out on an amplifier. Um, the advantage of these transponders is they can handle any mode that can, that's within the bandwidth. The reason they're not used on FM and AM is most of them, they're worried about too many users coming in and taking all and draining the power down. Because if you run continuous envelope modes, it just creates problems for the battery power. A lot of these satellites are very small, as you'll see. So the result is, it, especially with a linear amplifier where there's a lot of RF power dissipation, you know, we all remember the AB1 amplifiers, about 30% efficient. So 70% of that's heat that the satellite has to get rid of and some other issues that come up. So you don't want to run continuous duty modes on the linear satellites. Um, most of the newer satellites are in the CubeSat configuration. Uh, these are four inch square cubes. They weigh about 2.2 .2 pounds and you can stack them. There's one satellite right now that I think has got eight of them right now stacked together and you can put them in different configurations. Uh, but that one four by four by four module can hold the transmitter, the receiver, the control system, and the batteries and the charging regulators. Pretty impressive when you consider the original one we looked at the picture on the front was much bigger. Um, again, A07 was about 62 pounds. There are currently cube sets in this configuration, one four, four by four, four cube that are literally being used right now for communications and they work fine. You might ask about what satellites are available. The FM satellites are on the left. AO27, which is relatively old at this point, AO91, which are both AMSAT satellites. CAS3H, which is a Chinese satellite. ISS, which is the International Space Station, has a ham repeater and a digipeter on it. We'll talk about that towards the end. PO101 is a Malaysian satellite, SO50 Saudi. FO-118 is another Chinese satellite. These are available every day. The linear satellite is a little more different, and I'm going to tell you, notice things about sunlight intermittent. There are two older satellites. AO-7, like I told you, has been going 49 years, and the batteries are long gone. It only runs when it's in sunlight. Same thing with FO-29. Batteries have had a bad day. Uh, it was It's 27 years old, and it still works. And to tell you, it really does work. I was at W1OP down in Providence sat a Sunday with Alan, actually, right over there, SES. And I worked a uh, German and two Spanish stations through it from the, from the club down there. So the satellite's still very good. There's a lot of satellites listed on the right. They all have different configurations. Some of VHF to UHF, some of UHF to VHF. FO118 towards the bottom also has a 15 meter to UHF. Uh, uh, and transponder, which I haven't played with yet, but sh sounds rather interesting. Um, satellites are provided by AMSAT organizations, by educational organizations, governmental organizations. They're available. I'm sorry, am I working too old? Yeah, okay, I was afraid you were going to say that. 30 countries have launched amateur satellites since 1960. They're all freely available. Uh, there's no secret handshake special codes. You just go in. On the FM satellites, they publish PLs. You put a PL in and work the satellite. On the Illinois satellites, there's nothing you need to do other than transmit a signal. Uh, a lot of satellites, they're launched quite regularly. Uh, there's quite a few launches scheduled in the next couple of years. Strangely enough, a lot of Chinese satellites scheduled in the next couple of years. AMSAT has a, a thing on their website called the AMSAT News Service. 
They align, uh, they give you timely information on what satellites are going up and when and what's expected. Uh, AR also makes announcements on their bulletins of satellites as they become operational. Uh, I, I always start talking about uh, uh, satellites and I always get this from many years ago that a lot of people were originally involved with satellites with big VHF and UHFs and people say to me, do I need that? 60, 64 elements, ASL rotated, EME array. And the answer is no, this is not a good idea. You will have horrible times tracking things that are moving at fairly fast angular velocities with this damn thing. It is just, it works great for tracking the moon, it ain't a good idea for satellite work. There's a whole bunch of reasons you don't want to do that. You, you don't have to have azimuth and elevation tracking if you don't want to. There are antennas, and I'll show you one in a couple of minutes, that require no tracking, that are omnidirectional. They're all, you don't need a lot of gain to work these satellites. It's line of sight, mostly VHF and UHF. As long as you've got a clear sky path, you're good. There's no po real power required to do it. Um, and there's, it's possible to work the satellites with omni antennas. It's not unheard of. Now, everybody starts talking about what do I have to computerize? Do I have to get my rotors? Do I have to get radio control software? I'm going to tell you I have never run software my station control the radios or the antennas. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I just say that's what I've done. It works, and I do well, and I've got a lot of stuff worked. Uh, does it make it easier? Sure. But initially, you don't really need that. You can get a simple setup and work and try it before you start going through this uh, range of computer-controlled equipment. And Fred's very familiar with this. His station is very well set up for this. And uh, as he'll he'll tell you, it takes a little bit to get that running, doesn't it, Fred? It's not hard. It's more work. It's kind of like you say, start out simple and then be really good at that. Something more more. Right. Now, for example, everybody says, oh, I want something where I don't have to do any tracking. This is the solution. M2 makes a commercial antenna. This is about seven hundred dollars. It's a uh, it's two and four forty. It's called a Sat Pack, and they are actively being used. And you know, you say seven hundred dollars. It's a lot of money. And there are, by the way, the league and other people have published designs for omnidirectional antennas. I'll talk to, about those in a couple of minutes. But when you consider that to buy a rotator that's as L now is about $700 from Yesu without the antennas, this isn't really a incredibly bad deal. This is an eight SGZ's picture from his website. I've worked him on RS44. He's a good signal. This is his whole antenna farm for satellites. He's never done anything else. Homebrew antennas are possible. There's two series of antennas that basically generate a pat an antenna patent that's hemispherical coverage. Goes horizon horizon in all directions. They're called Lindenblad and Quadrophila. They've both been published in QST. They're on uh, a couple of them are on the AMSAT website, there's articles. Uh, if you're interested in building one, there's plenty of building information about them. <coughs> uh, now what happens when I want to build get on the air and do something? This is the problem I create. I, deci I decided in September of 2020, I had not been on the satellite since 1981. I was active from 76 to 81, and then I kind of dropped off. So I went in my garage one day and said, well, I'm going to build a helical antenna for 435. Very familiar with them, thank God. Uh, if you look at the antenna handbook, you'll find I wrote about half of the chapter on helical antennas many years ago. Uh, those, yes, those are little shelves from a Home Depot shelving unit in the reflector. That's what I found in the garage when I went to go make this. The, on the right side is the remains of a two meter beam that fell off a pole I had. So I put it back together using a QST article from 2021 to make a two element beam out of it that's circularly polarized. This is what I started with initially. Not that hard to make. Uh, I will admit I'm not a carpenter or a mechanic. I should start by saying I'm an electrical engineer for a reason. But a lot of people start with this. These are handheld beams, the 2 and 440. And uh, the left-hand one is the arrow antenna, very popular. And the right-hand one is the elk antenna held by its developer, K6LK. Uh, people 
use these on the satellite all the time. They work plenty of people. Uh, some people do strange things, like even though these are designed for portable use outside, I work one here in Toronto, has his balcony looks south from Toronto, so he took an, a rotator, an old U110 rotator, mounted the antenna at 30 degrees and rotates it so he can make all the passes south of Toronto. So he doesn't do anything more than that. To show you this really works, this is a card from ND0C, Randy out in uh, Minnesota. If you look on there, there's two red arrows. One red arrow says he's using an FT817 and FT818. He's using two radios, one to transmit, one to receive on different bands, because as you're familiar with the 817, you probably know that it only can do one band at a time. The other thing is uses an arrow to Yagi. That's his whole setup. Uh, that's all he ever uses. He can't be doing too bad. He has 605 grid squares confirmed on the satellite the last time I looked. And there's only 450 of them in the continental U.S., so he's worked a lot of stuff. Uh, very active, very very good signal. Again, FT817 is a 6-watt radio, not running power. What about using your horizontal, your beam you currently got at home for FM or for if you've got a sideband operator for sideband? Um, this will work if this passes below 40 degrees. And in fact, this is what W1OP does. We currently don't have ASL antennas at W1OP. So what we did is uh, for satellite passes, we picked satellite passes below 40 degrees. You got to remember, even when you got an 11 or 15 element Yagi, it's got a cone of radiation. It's not got a pencil beam. It's not a microwave antenna where it has a pencil beam. It has 20 or 30 degrees of cone minimum. So it does work. Don't try using it above 40 degrees, but you won't be happy. You'll be right in the nose of the antenna. It'll be not good. But I, I like I said, I worked the German two Spanish stations this past week from W1OP with exactly that kind of a setup. He could swear to it. He was there. <laughs> what to avoid? Please do not try to make a cue so with your typical dual band vertical, your X50 diamond, any of those things. They're great antennas for what they're intended for. They're compromise antennas because they're dual band. They're also don't have the greatest patent for doing satellite work. You'll have a rough time. I can do it, and I've made QSOs with dual band vertical, but I'll tell you, it's kind of frustrating. You're better off with the handheld beam. Believe you me, it's a lot better, and you will be a lot less frustrated. Do you need high power? This always comes up. Do I need to get a 100-watt amplifier? Do I need to get a 500? No. You should not be running under any circumstances more than 5 to 25 watts. That's the range you should be in. I will tell you that RS-44, I can hear myself uh, running 2 watts easily. So 5 to 25 will make you well heard. Again, you don't need high power. Where do I find orbital predictions? We're going to talk about this for a couple of minutes. Amsat.org, they, they generate, a, I'm going to show you how to generate a list from them of upcoming passes to particular satellites. Ham Radio Deluxe has that function, and two other people, N2YO and FG80J, also have excellent tracking prediction systems available online. Um, this is the Amsat website. If you go to Amsat.org, if you look, there's a tab in the splash bar that says Satellite Info, and if you click down, you'll see Past Predictions. And you'll get this pretty screen for entry. And let me go through that, what that means. They, they have a pull down for satellite you uh, show predictions for. You pick the satellite you like. You pick how many passes you want between 10 and 50. And these are passes that will be visible to you. Not The satellite may have 20 more passes over Europe you won't hear. But these are ones that, if you put your location, are visible to you. The next one is a block that says calculate latitude and longitude from grid square. And if you put in your grid square, six digits, I have, I'm at FN42 GT. I think you up here we're at FN42 EF, I think, but I won't swear to that. Uh, you put, put it in there and you hit calculate position. It'll give you latitude and longitude into the system, and you can go on from there. 
If, and you can directly add, add, put in your latitude and longitude if you know it. If you have a D-star radio and you put the thing on GPS, you'll get your latitude and longitude and you can just enter it directly. And then your elevation in meters above mean sea level. Uh, that's needed just to calculate some of the angles. And you hit predict and you're going to get an eye chart that looks like this. Because I put in for 10 passes. I'm going to blow it up a bit. And that's what 10 passes of data looks like. But I'm get, I get, bet everybody's saying, what are all those damn numbers? So let's go through them. So this is one, one prediction from the CAS-4B satellite, which is a Chinese satellite from 2021. The date's there in blue. The next block is AOS, acquisition of signal, UTC time. And the time, the time is given. The duration of the pass, which in this case is 11 minutes and 44 seconds, is next. AOS azimuth is where does this satellite start, come over the horizon? When you, so if you had a beam and you wanted to point it, where would I point it to pick it up when it just came over, came visible? So AOS azimuth is 280 degrees here. The next two blocks are maximum elevation, what the elevation is, and where that occurs. And in this case, it occurs, it's 22 degrees, and it occurs at 225 degrees from true. And then LOS azimuth is loss of, loss of signal azimuth. And loss of signal, in this case, is 145 degrees. So what happens in 11 minutes? It goes from 280 degrees and flips down, flips down to 145. It's not exactly a speed demon in that sense. And the time that it's going to lose the signals there too. And that's basic information. You got to hear the terms as and L in a lot of satellite stuff. As is azimuth and L is elevation. Uh, you're also going to hear two other terms if you read anything. Apogee and perigee. Apogee is the highest point of the orbit. Perigee is the lowest point of the orbit. These orbits are typically not perfectly circular. It's very difficult because the Earth is not perfectly a sphere. So it, it results in a situation where there's always some little perturbation. Some satellites are better than others. There are also satellites that have real huge uh, differences between azimuth, I'm sorry, between uh, 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 apogee and perigee that are elliptical orbits. Um, but they're not too common. This is what N2YO's prediction engine results in. It's a very similar thing. Start time, and you can set that for local on his. Azimuth that comes up at maximum altitude, what's the azimuth and elevation? End of the pass, where is it going to end and at what, at what uh, azimuth? So th that's a pretty nice tool. He does a good job. It's, it's a sponsored website, so you got to click through ads to get to it, but it works. And this gives you an idea. This is a RS-44 pass from 2021 that started basically... Well, well in northern Canada, passed to the east of us, and then ended around and went down around Miami. This took 20 minutes to do this. And by the way, I, I'm going to leave slides with the club. I, they can distribute them as freely as they wish so you can see pictures. But as you can imagine, you know, 20 minutes to do that is not exactly a speed demon problem. This is why you can use handheld antennas. It's not crazy fast. To work a QSO on the FM satellites, you're going to hear people say something like N2FYA, this is N1DM FN42, and he's going to come back and say N1DM, N2FYA, and FN41. That's kind of the exchange. There are exceptions. I will tell you that uh, the Providence Club about six weeks ago, I had a Boy Scout troop in on Saturday. And um, we got on the satellite. And the minute we said we were doing a Boy Scout demonstration, everybody went off except the guy I was talking to. And we had about a three-minute queue so, so the kids could ask him questions. So, can, can you repeat the QSO again? The QSO sounds something like N2FYA. This is N1DM FN42, which is my grid square. And he will come back and say, N1DM, N2FYA, FN41. He happens to be uh, down uh, Old Saybrook, I think, or just on the Rhode Island border. Correct. 
On the Lydia satellites, there's more rag chewing. And there's, there's, they still do an exchange like this, but then the guys will do rag chews. For example, I get on with a guy down in Maryland one day, and he says, where are you? And I said, Natick Mass. He says, oh, my God, Casey's. And for you who know Natick, Casey's is the local hango for hot dogs. And he says to me, and I says, how do you know Casey's? He says, I went to school at Fitchburg State, and every Friday when we got paid for work study, myself and my four buddies would pile into a car, we'd go cash our check at the Middlesex Bank in Natick, and then we go to Casey's and get three hot dogs all the way around. That was their gourmet meal for the week. So uh, <laughs> these, these Lydia Cusos are again on that sideband and CW. Here's CW. On the CW stations, they tend to send an RST report. And that's fine. Everybody likes to do that. It's not, not, not discouraged. You're going to hear digital Cusos occasionally on the linear satellites. There's some experiments. Yes. Um, there is fading, and there is some libration problems with the polarization, so you won't always be 599. There will be some fading. Because, again, especially if you're running a linear antenna like an arrow or a elk, they're linear antennas. The satellite spinning is some degree of libration fading. Right, exactly. So it's not it's not truly a five nine nine signal. And, some, and the other one that isn't five nine, I'll tell you. I live fifteen miles outside of Boston. When I point my beams east, I hear all the noise in God's green earth from every radio transmitter in the world. Um, so it's not fun for that. Um, if you for those who like to wear work rare grid squares, a DX AMSAT news service. Again, they have a bulletin every week, and it tells who's going to be on from where. Um, and there's a services tab on there also that explains all that. Uh, everybody always asks, how far can I work? And this is the big question that comes up. AO7 and RS44 are relatively high. They're at 915-mile high orbits at Apogee. So that gives them a range of about 5,000 miles. And the, t and the long longest orbit time you'll... Uh, visibility you get is about 23 minutes. FO29 is at 830 miles. It's got a range of about 4,700. All the rest of them are much lower. And as a result, uh, the range is significantly less. Uh, the International Space Station, HO119 and XW2, which are Chinese satellites, uh, both are relatively low, and the range is limited to 3,000 miles between stations. And you might wonder why, and this is the easiest way to explain it. If I'm in Boston, and you take a look at that little green line, which is right at the horizon of Boston, and point at a satellite, when it's, when it's in the middle of the North Atlantic, I'll hit it. And some station in Galway Island could hit it. Uh, it's pretty, that's pretty much the limit on the low altitude satellites. At 948 miles, where RS-44 is, if I point at the horizon at it, uh, Somebody in Turkey can work me. I haven't worked anybody in Turkey. Myself and a TA have been at it for the last month, playing around. We'll eventually get it done. But I've, I've worked a bunch of Europeans, as you'll see in a minute. Again, this is why when you're at low altitude, the red circle, you see less from lower altitude. That's just the, the, it's the geometry of the problem, plain and simple. So that's what the satellite sees. It's, and it moves Vertically in this particular satellite, RS-44, so it'll move from south to north. And night it'll move from north to south. But in any case, that's what it sees instantaneously. So I'm in Boston. I'm inside the circle. I can work so anybody else inside the red circle. They can see the satellite. If I work in RS-44, which is a blue, is the blue satellite ring, you'll notice I have considerably more area to work. And considerably more states and provinces. You might ask about what DX looks like. This is RS-44. This is a very good DX pass in the middle of the North Atlantic. As you can see, you can work um, the northwestern tip of Africa, a good part of Europe, a good part of the uh, Scandinavian countries, Greenland, Iceland, part of the U.S. And um, it, this does work. I've worked in EA-8 in 
Uh, in the Canaries, I've worked a bunch of Europeans. Uh, that's what the pass looks like when it gets up that high. Um, what can you work from the Northeast? You can work every state except Hawaii. And I'll say with the linear satellites and the FM satellites, let's say that for a minute. Europe, part of Central America, good northern half of South America, the North Atlantic, and obviously Northwest Africa. These are all workable at regular intervals on the satellites. How do you, uh, I guess we got a little cut off here. Let me just push that a touch. No, I guess we're not going to push it a touch. That isn't the problem. There's a new, there's a satellite that went up recently, IO-117, that's at 35, 3,600 miles apogee. From, it hangs about an hour in the sky here. It's a digipeter. It's basically a 1,200 board digipeter. It also has a store, store and forward capability. Uh, but people are working it, and it is possible to work Hawaii with that. I'm just looking into starting doing that. I, I will say that my last X25 QSA was on two meters in the 80s, so <laughs> I haven't done that recently, but I'm going to figure it out. We we'll always hear about Doppler shift, and this is the thing that scares people. We're all familiar with the problem. You listen to a fire truck coming at you. It's high, the pitch goes lower, the pitch goes lower, the siren, it goes by you, it goes lower and lower until you can't hear it anymore. Same thing happens at RF. you got to take into account these satellites are moving at roughly six, six miles a second in orbit. So the Doppler is real. On 435, that would be about a 20 kilohertz shift. It'll start 10 kilohertz high. And the satellite's right overhead or as high as it's going to be for you. It'll be on the frequency specified, and then it'll go 10 kilohertz low. Same thing happens on 2 meters, only 7 kilohertz. So it's 3.5 either way. You can compensate for this. There's a bunch of ways. One of the things they do do on all the satellites is invert the transponders. What that means is the 20 kilohertz and the 7 kilohertz subtract from each other. Otherwise, they'd add, which wouldn't be good. They'd make it worse. And so the result is you get about a 13 kilohertz Doppler. Now, this is the one thing that's nice about having computerized equipment. Computerized equipment could automatically compensate for the Doppler. But doesn't mean you have to do that. An FD817 works just fine. Your ICOM handy talkie, your Kenwood handy talkie work just fine. Um, what a lot of people do on FM is they program five memories, one 10 kilohertz up, one 5 kilohertz up, one on the channel, one 5 kilohertz below, and one 10 kilohertz below. And just as the satellite Doppler moves, they change memories. And it works pretty well. Uh, for side bands, it's a little more involved, but it works. You need to correct the Doppler by adjusting your receive VFO to follow the satellite. Try not to adjust both VFOs. It's an incredibly bad idea. You'll get really confused real quick. So the, the, the typical thing is to not adjust your transmit frequency, adjust your receive. Is that how you're set up, Fred? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Inside the pass band, right? Yeah. Uh, again, you need to compensate. Ideally, what do you need? You need a multi-band radio that can run full duplex. What do I mean by full duplex? If you're on two meters talking and you have an FM transceiver that can listen on 440 simultaneously, that's great for this. I use an FT8900 for FM cues, so it works fine. I set one, two VFOs. I transmit on one. I can hear myself on the other. I, at the Providence Club, we have two separate radios, so that works too. And either way works. A lot, a lot of the guys who go in the field, the girls, use a, use two walkies. And it works just well, fine. No problem. Uh, this allows you to hear the signal coming back while you're working, while you're working through the satellite to make sure you're making it and where you are. So it's, it's really good to, it's really good to be able to hear your signal. You don't want to transmit in the blind. Now, some examples of older radios that work on satellites that people are using. I have a friend, 
and Sterling is using a TS-2000. I have another friend, uh, uh, some of you might know K1IR, he uses an FT-847. A lot of people use FT-817s and some of these other radios are sprinkled around too. Uh, the FT-736, the 820, and 910 from ICOM. Today, the ICOM 9700 is very common. That's what I currently use. An FT-818 uh, is the newer version of the 817. It's the same basic radio. And it is possible with an ICOM 7100. Only, uh, I've only worked one guy doing that, but it did work. Um, yeah, because you need two radios. Because you can't, the trouble with the H17 is even though it's got multiple bands, you can only have one band at a time on that radio. Uh, you won't be able to hear yourself because it won't simultaneously be on. That's the problem. The minute you go to the memory, you could set it so it transmits on one band and receives on the other, but that's not going to help you with the satellite because you won't hear yourself. Um, for those who want uh, methods of tracking and radio control, there's tons of them. For PC users, there's a program called SAT PC32. For Mac, there's a thing called Mac Doppler. There's other programs floating around. CSN Technologies makes a little module that people take in the field to do tracking and Doppler correction. It's called SAT Tracker. If you're interested in it, you can buy it from DX Engineering. And by the way, the manual's online, so you can take a look on DX Engineering's website. Ham Radio Deluxe also has a satellite module. In fact, that's what I do to do a satellite uh, pass prediction. I use Ham Radio Deluxe, believe it or not, because I, I have it. There's a couple of books that are good. Uh, AMSAT, which any, anybody who's interested should join AMSAT, but they sell a book uh, calling Getting Started with Radio. This is the last time they generated it in print, I believe, right? 2019, Fred? Now it's only electronic. Uh, but it's an excellent book. Explains all, all the things we've talked about, how to set VFOs up on your radio, uh, how to track some of these uh, questions about different satellites and what they do. The other one is EMSATs and HAMSATs by ZL3DW. Very good book. Uh, it has simple stuff. It has, for those who want to write their own software for tracking, it has all the, the spherical trig equations you'll need. Uh, it's an excellent book. It's available on Amazon. It's, be, it's printed by the RSGB. You can also buy it from them, but Amazon is easier for us uh, for a variety of reasons, and that's where I bought mine. Uh, again, I heavily recommend you use the AMSAT website, amsat.org. AMSAT UK also has a website, amsat-uk.org. They have a lot of introductory information on there. That's excellent. Um, Talk a bit about the space station. I feel kind of silly doing this with you sitting here, Fred. Uh, but ARIS, the amateur, uh, amateur radio on the International Space Station, uh, is available quite regularly, except when they're doing spacewalks and maintenance periods. Uh, there are two Kenwood D710GAs. No, not the one you're going to buy up at HRO. It's a modified one. It's limited to 7.5 watts, if I'm right. Right, Fred? That, it depends on what they need for the cross Yeah. It has four punk fo possible functions for the two radios. FM voice from the astronauts, which is what they do with the schools. FM cross being repeated for VHF to UHF, which works fabulously and sounds incredibly strong when it goes over your ear. Slow scan TV, which is used occasionally in the packet digipeter, which is on occasionally. Uh, it's a Really nice program that's been running for years, and I have to tell you, I give credit to everybody involved, including people like Fred who offer his station to allow school groups to participate. It's really nice. I will tell you, we, like I said, we did a demo for the Pro, at the Providence Club for the Boy Scouts, uh, and we have a fairly good station, as Alan and Fred can tell you. We have a, you know, we have three remote HF stations that are uh, available to our members. We have a contest station. And we have a VHF, UHF station. And we got on with the kids on the satellite, and their eyes just lit up. They heard, we let them hear the Doppler shift. Uh, we, we showed them, oh, we're going to turn the knob here to correct for the frequency. And then when uh, KB1HY and I had a nice cue, so it was really nice. Yes, sir? Something that people often do for fun if you want to play with it. The ISS has 
voice transmitter is very loud. When, when we first turned on the new transmitter, we were actually making contact with the HD control of the It's very easy to hear the ISS down in the power radio, especially when you have the home What you might want to do is look up the downlink frequency for the astronaut stuff, the downlink frequency for the prospect group here, and put the four or five on top of the frequency to the memory and let the radio scan. You drive them around. Yeah, and Fred's rate's incredibly strong. Uh, just hard to believe how strong it is. When you realize that most of these other satellites are well under a watt, having a seven and a half watt transmitter on the ISS is like a bomb going off. In fact, I work a fair amount of the CubeSats only run 100 milliwatts output, and so that's a lot of difference in power. I, I thought I'd talk about the two Chinese satellites that were launched at the end of last year, because they're kind of interesting. This is a uh, FO-118, which used to be known as CAS-5A. It has three transponders. It has a 15 meter to 70 centimeter transponder, which you read that right, it is 15 meters. It has a two meter to 70 centimeter linear transponder, and it has the capability to do two to 70 centimeter FM too. Uh, and there was one test I heard about, Fred. Were you involved? They, got, they turned on all three at once? Right. It is. It's very sensitive. Uh, as I recall, the FM transmitter has no PO requirement. It's a, it's a carrier squelch. Uh, they have a camera on board that eventually is going to be turned on on the data channel. It ha they haven't disclosed all the details of that yet. But I can tell you that this thing works really well. This is another one. This is a, a HO-119, which has had a couple of names. This is a 2 to 70 centimeter linear transponder. Uh, to give you an idea how big this is, that's a 6U CubeSat. It's 4 inches thick, 8 inches wide, 12 inches high. With the, with the two solar panels deployed end to end, it's 39 and a half inches. It's not a huge satellite. Yeah, nowadays. But compare that and that and co compare that to the 62 pound AO7 I showed you earlier, which was big. This is a small satellite. It does incredibly well for the size. Everybody always asks me what I'm running, so I put this slide in. And I'm going to tell you that what I'm running here is what I'm running. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means it works. Uh, first, I will tell you that diamond antenna was an experiment. I'll show you why. I would never suggest anybody buying one for a satellite array again. Uh, I have a Cushcraft twist, uh, circularly polarized, 20 element Yagi, 10 in each direction. I have a bunch of preamps. Uh, Kenpro rotor system I bought at Deerfield at Neafest. Uh, a Yesu FT8900. Notice I don't set it on high. I sit on the lowest mid power setting. An ICOM 9700, and um, all the stuff in red's been obsolete for years. None of this is, a lot of this isn't new. I don't need the preamps with the 9700. What I do need them with is the FM radio. The 8900 suffers a little bit of sensitivity, and the preamps do help that. Uh, I've worked uh, an IW3 in, in uh, IW3 HRT in Italy with this, no problem. My antenna's 12 feet above the ground. I don't have a 60-foot tower. I don't have beams super high. I do have a box of preamps there, as I explained, for the FM satellites. I need them. Um, there's a bunch of issues with the FM 8900. And every radio I've tried in that position uh, that uh, was like that, where it was su super wideband radios, they just don't like it. Some You're better off almost with a 2 and 4 40 walkie where it's kind of limited. Uh, that's what's in the preamp box. You'll excuse the mess. I am not a mechanical engineer. Uh, there's two preamps in here. There's a splitter. There's a uh, tuning uh, tuner for two meters, if I, which was a horrible experiment that went bad, and two cross relays so I can either put the two meter antenna preamp on or the 440 preamp on. It has a lockout, so I can't by mistake transmit on the band I'm talking on. Because I did that one time with my... Advanced Receiver Research preamp, it did not do good things to the preamp. Anita, stop pointing at him. 
Happen, happen more than once, Fred? Um, everybody asks about geosynchronous satellites. We all hear about them. And the advantage of a geosynchronous satellite is you point the antenna and forget it. It's done. Unfortunately, there's none available for the U.S. ham radio, but there is one available in the Middle East, QO100, which is over Africa. It sits roughly over Central Africa. Um, the, it covers all of Africa, all of Europe, India, a good part of Pakistan, um, part of uh, Eastern South America. It does not cover the U.S., Japan, Eastern China, where most of the people live, New Zealand, Australia. It's on four, and it's, uh, it goes up on two gig, 2.4 gig and comes down on 10. It has two transponders. Um, it's a nice satellite. A lot of, in fact, anybody who worked FT8WW recently, one of the things he did is he took a QO100 terminal with him to Crozat Island and he was able to work French students in France, uh, during his uh, time at Crozat, which ended yesterday. Again, we have the terms that I've already explained. Uh -huh. And now, I'm, any questions, I'm more than glad to answer. Your contacts you make, are they random or, or, or scheduled? Random. Uh, yeah, he asked if I make, I'm sorry, scheduled or random contacts. Yes, you can make scheduled contacts, but I make mostly all random. Even even for the Boy Scouts, we didn't preset that. I worked KB1HY earlier in the day. He said he was going to be on the next pass, and I waited until I heard him and called him. You, you know, you mentioned the Chinese satellite, some of the uh, European satellites. Um, how, how do we get a satellite up there? How do we pick the frequency? There's a coordination body. How much does that cost? Uh, not cheap. <laughs> uh, there's two things that happen. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of launches and, and NASA activities involve CubeSats. Uh, they carry basically as extra stuff to do, not not the primary mission of a, a launch or a, a, a mission uh, from ISS. Uh, some of them were launched by like AO7 was launched from a regular launching facility as a satellite payload. Um, typically, they're given as a gift to the amateur community to use. Uh, because you got to understand when you make a rocket and you put stuff on top of it, you have to have ballast to keep it balanced. So typically we end up initially, a lot of times, AMSAT satellites ended up being the ballast, if you want to look at it that way. But they were active ballast. So it worked out pretty well. Um, a lot of countries, especially that are trying to do STEM, like Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, this Qatar satellite, was launched at the courtesy of the Qatar Satellite Corporation. So I wanted their satellites to transponder. So they built the transponder but mounted on Qatar's satellite. A commercial, uh, but in essence a commercial satellite. So, um, it's done typically as hams. We all know how to get to people and get things done. A lot of groups do. A a AMSAT's been very successful at that. AMSAT DL. Um, AMSAT UK at one point had a couple of satellites. The Japanese have had a couple of satellites. A lot of people trying to get into STEM want to show people what they can do. Uh, there's currently an Israeli constellation, six satellites that was just set up last year. I don't think it's been activated yet. Has it been, Fred? I don't know. But what they did is they took six technical schools and said, you each have a CubeSat we're going to launch. You build it and see if yours is better than the next guy's. So it's, it's, it's something to get the kids interested in this kind of work. Also, from an engineering point of view, you get them interested in engineering and science so they do this stuff in the future. Uh, so a lot of countries look at this as a way to get a STEM activity going. Does that answer your question? Uh, I was thinking that you know, as, as a grant effect, that we have so many spaceships going up in Miami that, you know, we just have a couple of extra, you know, Sometimes that happens, but the, 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 you got to understand, if you took a, just to give you an idea, if you launched, if you wanted to launch a satellite with ESA that costs, that says, let's say it's 50 pounds, the last time I saw a number, it was $25 million. Do you need to move the satellite to the jet? Huh? Do you need to move the satellite to the jet? 
They stay there. Not a good thing. And in fact, there is a there is some there are some regulations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There are some. There is a international proposal now that for every new satellite to have some degree of deorbit capability, but that hasn't been a hundred percent settled yet. As you can imagine, it's a UN activity and it's involved because not everybody wants to do everybody else's thing. Um, has anybody thought about or set up the satellites? You, know, you mentioned like uh, the distance limitation based on the heights of the satellite. Has anyone set up a satellite so that a transponder output matches another satellite's transponder? It's happened in the past. Currently, the, I don't think there's any current capability to do that. But in the late 80s, there were a series of satellites that had overlapping inputs and outputs. And that did work. And uh, actually, there was an IEEE, uh, Institute of Electrical Engineers. There was a professional article in the group that did that. Um, and uh, what, 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 what was it in? It was an IEEE Space Communications at the time. There was a nice article that HAMS got a lot of credit. It was an AMSAT initiative at the time. Yeah. Right now, the easiest way to do it, the strangest, is IO-117 has a store, store and forward thing. So you can put a message into it and say, I want it to repeat in 21,000 seconds. And you can calculate and say, oh, in 21,000 seconds, it's going to be over Malaysia and it'll repeat your message over Malaysia, even though you can't see the satellite anymore. Somebody else had a question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, do, you, um, do you perceive a uh, geosynchronous satellite for our area? No. Fred, you, you might have better information than I do. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a geosynchronous satellite over our area in the future? There is a great deal of interest in ARCC about sponsoring a project like that. The, the problem is it's very difficult to build a satellite like that because to get it in the right orbit, you have to have roughly control to maneuver the satellite to the right place to the orbit to work. It would be very complex to build an average satellite. Most of what we have are basically like throwing a baseball in the space. Once they're up there, they're going to be in whatever order they're in, and you can't change them. The other issue that comes up is the geosynchronous orbit, the ring and the, over the equator, is her, very heavily regulated about where you can put a satellite. Because there's so many commercial satellites up there in military. Mostly commercial, strangely, if not military. But nonetheless, there are both. And they are, what are they spaced? Uh, two and a half degrees now, Fred? Or some? Yeah. There was an active satellite called AO 40. Yeah. And that was kind of a disaster, basically, the propulsion of the system was still the satellite. Um, so, very, very hard to do that. Yeah. And like I said, the other issue is you, you have to go in internationally, apply to get a slot. And that's involved because every commercial company in the world wants a geosynchronous satellite for some reason or another. Yes. <laughs> I'll let Fred say it. Um, I got to be a little careful here because not all this is covered. But Eris, you all have probably heard of something called the Lunar Gateway, which is a plan for the space station and all the way around the world. Let's just say that if that happens, there's a good chance I'll be able to get it. So what would you I don't know about that. Um, you can obviously leave me. You can go here. You want to do it now. Yeah. Um, the Lunar Gateway would, would probably be the yeah. yeah, The FCC in China is just for frequency. They coordinate with the ITU. There's an <coughs> ITU coordination method. Because these are internationally allocated, then you notice. Most of the satellites we talked about, other than the ones that said AO7, were not U.S. satellites. They coordinate, there's a, uh, ITU, International Telecommunications Union, runs a coordination activity. 
And uh, they actually have an online website you can look at and see what's coordinated and when it's who's coordinated what for the future. It's all done through ITU. And there's no, uh, last I know, there was no course, right, Fred? Right. That's one of the hard things is that you have to worry about everybody's paying time. Right. Because it's kind of like, you know, what we're doing is we're going to Yeah. So that's very much Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of. I know you said it's on your phone. Go sat watch. But there's a lot of applications now for satellite tracking that are available, um, and they all give uh, give a lot of a lot of information about a the technical parameters of satellite. The ones that are orientated towards hams also give information on what transponders are on. In some cases, if they're on the air currently, things like that. That's why I kind of suggest the ham sites because it gives you a little more information. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, one thing if you're interested in trying to find the aerial ham Get one of the three satellite tracking apps. All you need to do is put the cell phone on the ground at your feet and put the track of the satellite up and you can look at your phone and get back to where the internet is. And it's kind of a short person to add up, okay? And it works great. And most of those apps are free. They don't cost anything. All you need is two bow fangs and an arrow. Yep. You're going. Anybody got anything else? Great job. My pleasure. Thank you.